It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 99th annual meeting of the American Council of AC Learned Societies. Uh, and I think it's its 14th here in Philadelphia. Uh, to some of us, it seems like it's been about 98 meetings in Philadelphia, but, but actually it's been a few years. Um, so um, it's good to have you all here. As you can imagine, we're thinking a lot about anniversaries um, as we approach the centennial of our founding next year. And I'm looking forward to the many opportunities we will have uh, to think and talk about the origins of ACLS over the coming months. But it is 2018, after all. Uh, so this morning, I'd like to focus on another milestone about which much has been written lately, the 50th anniversary of the tumultuous events of 1968, a year that consolidated the sense of the 60s as a significant cultural and political hinge in American history. Protests against the Vietnam War, assassinations, demonstrations, the police riot of Chicago, 68, all catalyzed divisions between those rejecting the establishment and those demanding support for law and order. Campuses became battle zones as student strikes turned to building occupations that were cleared, often violently, by the police. Campuses were indeed contested. I know, I was there. Learned societies were drawn into this maelstrom. The December 1968 meeting of the MLA was disrupted, disrupted when an MIT professor, Louis Kampf, Kampf, great name, uh, was arrested for hanging posters in the meeting hotel's lobby. Professor Kampf was a member of the new university conference, which declared its aims, quote, to make the MLA more responsive to the demands of a society and a university in desperate need of radical change and to give a forum to graduate students and young faculty. They are, the insurgents asserted, the most exploited and least listened to amongst us. They experience the MLA meeting as a corral and auction block. Their grievances must be heard. Protests and disruptions at other society meetings prompted the directors of our ACLS societies, known then as the Conference of Secretaries, to convene a special conference on the theme of confrontation and learned societies. Authors contributing to the conference recommended that learned societies stay aloof from campus and political confrontations. Quote, there's little good we are equipped to accomplish by contentious involvement and much harm may come of the attempt, end quote, wrote one. George Winchester Stone of the MLA ridiculed Lewis Kampf's critique of his association and agreed that societies as professional associations should not enter the public fray. That Professor Kampf soon became president of the MLA highlights the changes rippling through the academy at this time. Since the 60s, political divides outside academia have widened, while the academy itself has been a regular object of suspicion and derision from those who objected to the social and cultural changes unleashed in the 60s. Richard Nixon, as you know, was first elected president in 1968, and the next year invoked the idea of a silent majority, enduring impatiently the vocal protests of a few. Ronald Reagan launched his political career by opposing student protests at Berkeley. The culture wars of the 70s and 80s extended the conflicts of the 60s on an intellectual plane. In the 1997 volume, What's Happened to the Humanities, a group of senior scholars surveyed the, quote, battlefields of an extended Kulturkampf, uh, end quote, in which the huma humanities, subjects that have proven extremely sensitive to pressures for social change in society at large, fought bitter and clamorous battles over every liberal cause, from freedom of speech in the Vietnam War to anti-colonialism and the non-referentiality of language. With what results, these established scholars asked, have the humanities made themselves into the conscience of the society? Two of my predecessors as ACLS president contributed to this volume. Rereading their essays and the whole book, one glimpses a consensus of that what happened to the humanities and the culture wars did not diminish what our fields had to offer the public, but rather expanded our stock and trade. John Darms worried about the erosion of the national infrastructure for research support in the humanities, a focus he pursued ardently when he came to ACLS. While he was concerned that recently emerged intellectual paradigms might alienate potential donors, 
who knew an older humanities from their undergraduate years, he asserted that, quote, few of us would wish to deny the demographic and political realities that have given rise to some of the best multicultural scholarship and that the intellectual contributions of postmodern theoretical approaches have significantly affected the way many of us go about our work, end quote. In his detailed study of curricular offerings, Francis Oakley rebuffed the idea that, quote, the American professoriate is somehow bent on engineering nothing less than the collapse of Western civilization itself, and found remarkable persistence in the subjects and methods taught by faculty, including a great deal of close reading and a continued sympathy for the new criticism. Today's question is less about what happened to the humanities than where are the humanities? Where should they be found? The humanities should be found throughout academia, I would say. They should not be confined to elite, well-resourced institutions. As some institutions and funders find they must cut back on the resources made available for humanistic research, we know that ACLS must grow to meet the increasing needs of humanities faculty across the diverse landscape of higher education. In 2018, we will accept the first applications for our new Mellon ACLS Community College Faculty Fellowship Program. This new set of awards is designed to support the research ambitions of faculty teaching at two-year colleges. Community colleges are an area of particular interest to ACLS, since we know that their campuses are where the majority of college students in the United States first encounter the humanities. We're also aiming to recognize research excellence and promise at teaching intensive four-year institutions. As I mentioned at last year's annual meeting, thanks to a generous grant from Arcadia, charitable fund of Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin, we've increased the number of fellowships available in our central program by 10% to 78, with the intent of extending the reach of our program. This initiative has enjoyed great initial success. We received applications from faculty at 27 institutions that had never, never before been represented, uh, represented among the roster of ACLS applications. Our applications now ask for a statement of teaching responsibilities so that our selection committees can factor that information into their choices. And starting this year, we're also offering uh, project development grants of $5,000 each to select finalists in our ACLS fellowship competitions who hail from colleges and universities with high teaching responsibilities. It's our hope that this support will help them advance their research projects and perhaps to meet uh, success in a subsequent competition. Where should the humanities be? They should be active and visible in the public arena. Queen Elizabeth is said to have been quoted uh, saying, I must be seen to be believed. That is, her credibility depends, at least in part, on her visibility. That is certainly true of the academic humanities as well. But I think we miss important opportunities if we think of public engagement as only a form of public relations, of publicity for what we do. It's reasonable enough to think that greater public education of what we do will result in greater public support for the humanities. But equally, perhaps more important, is the motive that supporting the public in its search for meaning and understanding enacts the basic value proposition, proposition of the humanities themselves, that as knowledge grows, life will be enriched. Our public fellows program, which has placed nearly 125 recent humanities PhDs in career building positions in government and nonprofit organizations, is an exploration of new pathways for the circulation of humanistic knowledge, perspectives, and methods throughout society. The program is now in its eighth year, and it was remarkable to receive applications this year from graduate students and recent PhDs who tell us that they have known about the Public Fellows Program since they entered graduate school. We are especially proud of this demonstration project, which exemplifies the dynamic potential of doctoral education in the humanities. This year's fellows, um, whom we look forward to naming in June, will undertake significant projects at partner organizations like the Smithsonian, the Inno Innocence Project, Public Radio International, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Our LOOSE program in religion, journalism, and international affairs aims to bring the insights of scholars of religion into partnership with journalists so as to add balance and nuance to their coverage of national and international affairs that have a religious dimension. 
While the goal of the loose ACLS program is to encourage collaboration between subject matter experts and media experts, an added benefit of this work is that scholars and journalists will have more opportunities to interact and learn about each other's motivating questions, methods, and practice. I think it's safe to say that humanities scholars and journalists do have much in common. The scholarly values which ACLS prizes, analytical rigor, expressive precision, and especially undaunted questioning are hallmarks of high quality journalism. Through the loose ACLS initiative, we aim to affirm these connections. And I would also note that we're beginning a new Mellon-funded faculty fellowship program called Scholars in Society this year, inspired in part by efforts such as the Mellon Public Scholars Program at UC Davis that engages graduate students and their faculty mentors in collaborations with public community-based organizations. I know that the American Anthropological Association, the American Historical Association, and the American Academy of Religion, among other ACLS member societies, have been actively developing resources for scholars seeking to go public. Where should the humanities be? They must be in the digital realm. The recent revelations about the abuse of personal data of tens of millions of Facebook users is an index of the serious consequences of the swift movement of modern life into online space. Members of the ACLS community have long been grappling with the implications of the digital transformation of communication, knowledge infrastructure, and our engagement with the public. Wendy Hui Kung Chun, a 2016 ACLS fellow and professor of media studies at Brown University, is exploring the ways supposedly neutral algorithms and machine learning processes entrench social categories like race and gender in the digital domain. Borku Baikurt, a graduate student at Columbia University, who was just named as a 2018 Mellon ACLS Dissertation Completion Fellow, is finishing her dissertation in communication studies on the outcomes of early efforts to create so-called smart cities in the United States. As she puts it, rather than supplementing or merely reenacting old disparities, digital technologies produce, represent, and conceal new dimensions of inequality. Other fellows are exposing the complex histories of how we've arrived at our algorithmic big datafied present. Margaret O'Mara, a 2015 fellow and professor of history at the University of Washington, breaks down the popular narratives about positive disruption and the supposed rugged individualism in, uh, behind Silicon Valley entrepreneurship, stories that serve the interests of the billionaires who profit from new digital technologies at the expense of individual privacy and economic well-being of many citizens. Going back much further into our past, Stephen Berry, a professor of history at the University of Georgia and the principal investigator of an ACLS digital extension grant, traces the data revolution in American society to 19th century efforts to ramp up public health regimes. His project is colorfully titled, Big Bad Data and the Birth of Death as We Know It, How Our Mortality Became Disciplined to Science, the State, and Actuarial Tables. You may recall that both Amara and Barry, incidentally, have spoken on our fellows panels uh, in recent years. Later today, ACLS board member Marwan Kreide of the University of Pennsylvania's Annenberg School of Communication will moderate a discussion about the ways democracy is both nurtured and strained by contemporary media cultures. I'll take this opportunity now to seed that sure to be fascinating session with questions for you to ponder. What roles should the scholarly humanities play in deciphering the complexities of our media-saturated lives? How might learned societies and ACLS itself foster the kinds of research agendas and public conversations that will help society address the very human and ethical dimensions of the digital that are sometimes treated as purely technological in nature? Where should the humanities be? They should be crossing borders. As the ACLS's first chairman, Char Charles Homer Haskins, recounted in The Rise of the Universities, there was in the 14th century a great revival of learning, a great influx of new knowledge into Western Europe, chiefly through the Arab scholars of Spain who offered the works of Aristotle, Euclid, Ptolemy, and the Greek physicians, the new arithmetic. This last was a digital transformation of a sort, 
for geometry and mathematics became possible when the use of Arabic digits dissolved the burden of calculating and cumbersome Roman numerals. Even at this early point, the pursuit of knowledge was essentially a transnational enterprise. It remains so ineluctably today. ACLS was founded to re represent the American Academy abroad, and we continue to nurture the creation of cross-border scholarly networks. Our former humanities program in Belarus, Russia, and the Ukraine has given rise to a regional learned society, the International Humanities Association, which, with help from ACLS, is now a partner with our member society, the Association of Slavic, East European, and, Eur East and Eurasian Studies, in, in organizing joint meetings. Over the past 10 years, our African Humanities Program, funded by the Carnegie Corporation, has awarded fellowships to nearly 400 scholars from the continent. We're discussing an additional $5 million grant from Carnegie to continue to provide fellowships and to help redress the balances, imbalances in scholarly communication. Only 3% of the world's academic publishing at the moment comes from Africa, a number which is incommensurate with the depth of scholarship being produced there over an impress impressive range of disciplines. So in the next years, our program will scale up assistance to fellows developing their research into manuscripts publishable by African presses. The 50 years since 1968 represent one half of ACLS's history. We have grown substantially in that span. Jim O'Donnell, chair of the board, asked yesterday if we could compare what things were like at ACLS uh, in 1968 and, and how they are now. And I have a couple of figures uh, to, the, to his question. In 1968, we awarded 108 fellowships. This year, that number is close to 350. But I think the difference in the amount of dollars awarded would be more striking, and I don't have those numbers. 50 years ago, but I'll get them. 50 years ago, our endowment, calculated in 2018 dollars, stood at 29 million. Today, the balance is over 140 million with our total net assets uh, over or almost 180 million. In 1968, the 13 member ACLS board of directors included one woman. The delegates to ACLS were all men. Perhaps the most significant indicator of the health of ACLS and of the academic humanities is the increase in our membership from 33 societies to 75 today, a change that is indicative of the efflorescence and diversification of humanities scholarship over the last half century. Finally, we might ask, why the humanities? What do they offer? The answer to that question is the same answer given in 1919 to the question of why create ACLS. The generation that lived through World War I had seen the passions of war overcome the values of peace. They had learned that it would take special efforts to sustain the ideals that underlie humanistic study in the face of forces of domination, destruction, and materialist distraction. Today, there is still a great social, national, and international need for what the humanities have to offer but scholarship needs support and structure to have the greatest possible impact. That's why ACLS and its member societies are so essential. That includes my report today, which is, uh, has been so much shorter than usual because I'd like now to call on my colleague, Vice President of ACLS, Steve Wheatley. While not at ACLS in 1968, it may seem to us that he has been, um, uh, here since then, but he's been on staff for 32 years, which is certainly much more than half of, of, of that history. And, and I'll have some final remarks to add when he is finished. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Pauline. I want to express my gratitude to the Council for the opportunity to have served this dynamic organization and its noble mission for the past 32 years. I was calling this turn at the podium my valedictory, but then realized that such a label might be th thought to require speaking in Latin. <laughs> if I did, this speech would be even shorter than it will be, as my Latin vocabulary is limited to the state mottos I had to memorize for a grade school competition. <laughs> While I still remember them, I will speak in English, but briefly. One of ACLS's many distinctions is our somewhat antique name. 
In the days before voicemail and telephone auto attendance, we had a receptionist who answered calls with a centurion Council of Learned Societies. I'm sure that her justly proud tone intimidated many salespeople making cold calls to sell <laughs> toner cartridges or other office supplies. But there's a snare hidden in the name, and it's the past participle serving as an adjective. For we are not complacently satisfied with past achievements, but focused forward aggressively. Our member societies and our whole enterprise are indeed learned, but they are also dynamically learning, constantly searching for new ways to mobilize knowledge and scholarly energies so as to bring the humanities to the fore of academia and public culture. My career at ACLS has allowed me to learn much. I came to the Council in 1986 to administer a program of international scholarly exchange, an experience that helped me learn how profoundly the structure and organization of different academic systems affects the knowledge produced. Engagement with the realm of scholarly communication as it was being reshaped by digitization taught again the hard truth that technological innovation and social organizational change move at much different speeds. My friends in the Conference of Executive Officers have taught me that scholarly self-governance is hard work, but all the more rewarding for those who can maintain a collegial determination. In an age of economic despair, ACLS thrives as a very real community of values. <clears throat> Time will not allow uh, me to thank all who have taught me but I cannot overstate what an inspiration it has been to work with my dedicated and very able colleagues on the ACLS staff. They are a hearty brand of, band of brothers and sisters who have sustained me and ACLS through many challenges. It's been a single, singular honor to work with a succession of ACLS presidents. Fred Burkhart resuscitated ACLS from a near-death experience in 1957, retired from ACLS in 1974, but continued to work on the Darwin correspondence, the connection I had with him, until his death in 2007. Stan Katz brought me to ACLS from Chicago as he brought new energy and ambition to the council. John Darms reinvigorated our fellowship program. He did not, alas, live to see his initiative in full flower. Frank Oakley helped steady our ship after John's death, imparting good cheer and hard-earned wisdom in equal measure. Over the past 15 years, Pauline has brought ACLS to new heights. As she has strengthened ACLS, I have drawn strength from her unswerving fidelity to the highest standards of excellence. When we commemorate next year the centennial of ACLS's founding, I hope we can take pride in our historic achievements, but that we do not dwell only in the past tense. ACLS is grounded in the conviction that knowledge liberates the mind and the soul, but that knowledge can never be finite or final. There are always more questions to ask, and ACLS must support and enable those who will ask them. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. What you've just heard exemplifies the many reasons why Steve Wheatley has been such an extraordinary vice president of ACLS. His keen intelligence, sparkling eloquence, exceptional humility, unstinting dedication, affection for his colleagues, and abiding passion for the mission of this organization. No one knows the history of ACLS better than Steve. For 20 years, he's been the COO of ACLS, managing all aspects of our operations with energy, equanimity, and imagination. For 32 years, as you've heard, he's been the anchor and fount of human kindness in the office, who knows and cares about what everyone is up to, from our sorrows, fears, and joys to the names of our children, dogs, and cats. No one who's been in the same room with him has not marveled at his unflappable good cheer and amazing wit. I've always thought that his brain is an enormous Rolodex of anecdotes, jokes, and historical references to just about any topic anyone might mention. The connections made by his mind are as swift as those of his heart are genuine. When I arrived at ACLS almost 15 years ago, my predecessor, Frank Oakley, handed me a slim manila folder marked Transition Stuff, which constituted the entirety of my orientation. Um, 
and he commented in the folder, in something in the folder, that he had no doubt that Steve would continue, quote, in the future as in the past to serve ACLS at a very high level, unquote. During one of Steve's and my first conversations, he made a point of saying that he didn't expect to retire from ACLS, which I took as a typically gracious invitation from him to replace him at my will. The smartest thing I've ever done as president was to resolutely decline that offer. He's been a true partner in every way, a sounding board and strategist who can figure out how to get things done uh, to put flesh on the bones of every new initiative. Every meeting run or speech delivered has benefited from his wisdom and craft, and every decision from his sound judgment. He's a trusted friend whose generosity knows no bounds. Three years ago, when I injured my right foot and required surgery, he promptly went out and injured his left foot and <laughs> underwent surgery. We had a matching pair of boots that led many people to ask what was a foot at ACLS. <laughs> But now the day has come when I hoped that I hoped would never arrive when I've had to accept Steve's decision to retire. There's no element of this organization that does not bear his imprint and no one who can imagine ACLS without him. For that reason, I'm very happy to announce that Steve's name will in fact remain permanently at ACLS thanks to a gift from an anonymous donor to establish the Stephen C. Wheatley Fund at ACLS. And thinking how best to deploy these new resources, my first thought was, of course, to ask Steve. <laughs> but what if he wanted them to go towards supporting a fellowship in vexillology, the study of flags that has always fascinated him? <laughs> I suspected that our fellowships team would shake their heads in dismay. ACLS is a federation of learned societies, now 75 in number, something that Steve has always kept at the forefront of his and our minds and his work on their behalf has been tireless. His support of and counsel to the Conference of Executive Officers has benefited all of its organizations, as well as the relationships among them. There are some who thought that this was enti his entire job description. A former executive director sits on the search committee for Steve's successor and was astounded to learn that the work with the learned societies could lay claim to at most 20% of his time. I thought it was 100%, she exclaimed. So I think it's only fitting that the Stephen C. Wheatley Fund be devoted to the work of ACLS's learned societies, their maintenance and strengthening, as our mission statement declares. Of course, if Steve wants it to go toward vexillological studies, we'll have to reconsider. The gift we received is but a start, and we would welcome your help in making it as robust as possible. His name will remain in our books, as will his person in our memories, and I'm glad we can pay tribute to the legacy of Steve's work at ACLS, there was, there's no way I could ever adequately express my profound gratitude to him for all he's done. So thank you, Steve, and thank you, my friends. <laughs>